Following each of the presentations, we'll have a chance for some Q and A's. And after the presenters, we'll be breaking into breakout groups um, to really talk about, uh, have facilitated discussions regarding the science data and delivery needs that are necessary to better inform uh, landscape scale conservation design designs in a changing climate. Um, the intent is to have a dialogue uh, with the participants or about you know what landscape level decisions are you facing, what data and or tools are you using or would like to use, learning more about your information needs and information gaps, and to hear your thoughts on whether we need a conservation uh, blueprint in the Northeast. So, and if so, how do we approach that? So without uh, any, any further, let me, uh, let me uh, introduce our first speaker of the day. John Cantor is uh, from the National Wildlife Fed Foundation, and he will speak on the science uh, principles for achieving landscape scale conservation goals. John joined the uh, National Wildlife Federation in 2017 and serves as their senior wildlife biologist. Um, I'm gonna cut my remarks short there just so we have more time. So John, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, let's start. Well, thanks, Rick. Um, before I put up my slides here, just a little more of an introduction uh, to uh, some of you. I'm a familiar face, a familiar old face here in the Northeast because I spent most of my career as the uh, non-game and endangered uh, species, uh, first the first biologist and later the program supervisor at New Hampshire Fishing Game uh, and was involved with many of the uh, Northeast regional efforts um, to do uh, conservation planning and implementation. Make sure I get my, uh, my screen shared here. All right, do we have the title slide of Achieving Landscape Scale Conservation, A Mind's Eye Journey from uh, Forest Stand Maps to Google Earth? Can I get an okay on that? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. All right, so uh, what, what I wanna do um, for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes is just talk a little bit about um, my perspective on how uh, you know, conservation planning and, and uh, implementation um, has taken, taken place over the years uh, that I've been uh, working as a, as a wildlife biologist, uh, primarily in the, in the Northeast US, but more uh, recently in a national position at uh, National Wildlife Federation. I know I've seen in, in a couple of the other presentations today, um, you know, many good descriptions on, on uh, the basis for uh, landscape uh, scale conservation and planning, but uh, to take us way back or not so far back, um, it's really, we think about the, the principles that, that we are uh, applying here, developing and applying here um, they, they really go back to, you know, E.O. E. Wilson and Robert MacArthur's work um, looking at, uh, you know, island biogeography. Ge so isolated islands have more evolution, but less immigration um, and higher extinction resulting in lower biodiversity than islands next to mainland. So these concepts um, and have been uh, debated, discussed, applied to um, to systems like tropical rain uh, forests, uh, the, the work that Tom Lovejoy did looking at uh, these uh, species area relationships um, and uh, in, in kind of verifying that, you know, these systems um, do operate, uh, our, our natural systems, the more fragmented they are, um, they become islands and, uh, and behave um, as we would expect them to based on the information that has been learned through studying island systems. 
So island biogeography and those concepts were, you know, poured into our heads towards the latter part of our undergrad and in, in uh, uh, grad school when I was at the University of New Hampshire um, in, uh, in, in the, uh, the late 80s. And, you know, I, I really hadn't given much of a thought. Yeah, in terms of the the work that I was doing when I when I first got out of graduate school, I was working with with foresters on integrating wildlife habitat consideration uh, in into uh, forest management planning, and you know we we looked at we may have an aerial photo to refer to, um, you know the forester had their stand map, and we were thinking about on this landowner's hundred acre property, uh, you know what could we do to to kind of uh, uh, you know, increase the diversity of habitats, maybe by, uh, you know, breaking up the age classes or diversifying, um, you, you know, the, the stand types. And a, a lot of that was guided by information that, uh, that Dick DeGraff and um, Deb Rudis had published in uh, this, uh, this Forest Service publication that some of you may still have on a bookshelf somewhere. And we really had this great information about how uh, the vertebrates of the Northeast, um, you, you know, were, were distributed by, by forest type uh, and by age class. And we could make some, some pretty good decisions based on that. And then Marco Yamasaki and Bill Leake, uh, John Lanier and others went on to kind of apply these and in, in, uh, in measure, um, you know, how these vertebrate species responded to changes in the forest. And we felt pretty good about being able to take 400 acres and uh, make that into good habitat uh, to, to support a range of species. About that same time though, um, that was the, the, this, uh, the spurt in growth in the Northeast uh, in human population growth and in increases in forest fragmentation that, that we are all seeing. And so um, in, in some ways uh, we, we abandon our work with the foresters to say that it's it's time to get out there and work with the community planners. We we need to look at the scale, uh, not just at the the forest um, ownership that an indiv individual forest forester is looking at, but we need to look at um, what habitats are available in a, a community, and we need to get to the planning boards and conservation commissions to be able to talk to them about. Uh, how they can protect the important resources at the level of their town. Um, and, you know, more information is coming out about the, the impact of, of fragmentation, uh, highways, uh, cutting off populations of wildlife from, from one another, reductions in gene flow. Um, you know, we had examples like the, the Florida panther before the, the Texas bachelors were um, were introduced uh, and, and we're actually seeing in real time, um, you, you know, the impacts of uh, reduced uh, genetics um, and, and how that was, uh, would have been driving that, that population to extinction. So um, effects of, uh, of fragmentation on wildlife, it reduces species diversity, changes the composition um, you know, we, we talked a lot at that time about forest interior birds uh, and, uh, it, and how can we maintain large blocks of contiguous forests um, because we knew that, uh, you know, you would change species composition and go from things like scarlet tanagers uh, and hermit thrushes to cardinals and, uh, and American robins. So, um, Changes in species composition, uh, blocking of animal movement, thinking of terrestrial species like, uh, like salamanders that are, are spending most of their time, um, you know, in the forested upland around their, their breeding ponds and if uh, isolated from or if restricted from moving safely to those breeding ponds, uh, it's certainly, um, you know, the, the population could become locally extinct. So with that, um, the, the next step was, well, how, how can, we, can we look at a larger uh, landscape scale for uh, conservation planning? And uh, uh, somewhere about the mid part of my career, we, I worked with a, a number of colleagues to develop this, um, this community uh, planning guide for a, a guide for town officials, community planners to integrate wildlife habitat in, in, into their, their towns master planning process. 
Uh, and luckily at that time, the technology was changing. We were having to rely on just uh, uh, stand maps and a couple of old aerial photos, but uh, GIS was, was coming in, um, you know, in, into use. And uh, we were able to look at various uh, habitat features across an entire town uh, landscape. And, and uh, those were the days of, of kind of uh, mapping layer upon layer to come up with uh, air areas of co-occurrence to uh, determine uh, those places that might be more important or would be more important to protecting uh, wildlife and, and biodiversity. So um, as, as we shift through these scales, I think you know, the, the, the basic um, kind of three tiers of representation, resilience, and connectivity uh, apply. Uh, representation, uh, conserving the full array of species and ecosystems, kind of that, uh, you know, the Noah's Ark, not just of the animals, uh, but of the, the various uh, habitat types in their interrelationships. Resilience, um, lands and waters that offer su sufficient space uh, and su suitable um, conditions, including in a changing climate, uh, and connectivity. Um, and, and certainly connectivity becomes very important uh, in terms of in the face of a, of a rapidly changing climate. So we've gone from thinking about a stand uh, or a forest ownership to thinking about a town um, to thinking about how we do things uh, uh, across states and in regions. And, the concepts and the, uh, our ideas as, as wildlife and conservation biologists are kind of reaching the upper echelons of, of, uh, of political leadership and discussions. And, and this, uh, this year we get um, kind of a recognition at the highest level that, uh, that hey, we need to protect natural lands um, in order to conserve biodiversity to um, you know, mitigate the impacts of, of, uh, of um, uh, too much CO2 in the atmosphere. And the 30 by 30 initiative, or also known as America the Beautiful, um, is not only is it a, a you know, it's a, a national goal, but it, you know, comes through uh, international uh, channels as well. So what is the, the evidence um, uh, of area-based targets? This is uh, information um, from a, a, pa a paper that uh, Stephen Woodley um, shared with uh, Bruce Stein, uh, our chief scientist, um, and myself to be able to use uh, species area curves. Uh, again, um, with this audience, not much to, to do, but kind of run through these uh, that uh, conservation planning under a systematic um, uh, uh, process and minimizing sizes of ecosystem shifts to avoid regime shifts. And thinking about a uh, percentage of area that is needed um, and building off uh, a range of ecological um, values, anything from you know smaller scale uh, protection and uh, needed for endangered species in, in rare systems all the way up to um, getting into uh, uh, carbon uh, rich ecosystems and climate change refugia. So kind of the blending, the, the biodiversity and end of things along with um, uh, climate change and, uh, and, and looking at not only at um, protecting biodiversity, but protecting uh, biological and ecological processes. So the, the 30 by 30 targets um, come out of the Convention on, on uh, Biodiversity. First, uh, we're set in, in, uh, in, in 2010, and we're being revised um, in 2020. And, and uh, from these goals that were set up through the IUCN, we, we get the, the, uh, the America the Beautiful version um, of 30 by 30. And, Looking at kind of the, the state of um, conditions at, at, uh, at, at this point in time, uh, about 15% of, um, of terrestrial 
lands are in some kind of protection in about uh, just under 18% of marine systems. And from this 30 by 30 uh, and related initiatives, uh, we get into a debate about um, well, what is, uh, what do we count as being uh, conserved for biodiversity? What, 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 is, what, what lands qualify for, for, uh, for being um, protected? And we have the, the two kind of basic um, you know, protected areas, which uh, uh, you know, gap one and gap two, perhaps all can kind of agree, have a, a biodiversity focus are in there. Um, but there is a recognition that there are these other effective area-based conservation measures. And um, I think it's important just to, to note that not only do we know that there's a lot to be done for biodiversity uh, conservation on private lands, but at an international level, um, you know, there's this, this recognition that we need to have, uh, be able to define areas that are not falling into our, our uh, what we would consider as classically protected. In the U.S., um, so 12% of the land um, is, is in uh, uh, gap one and two, uh, and 26% uh, of the uh, oceans are in the strictest protection, um, but that includes a large percentage of it in a uh, national monument that was uh, protected uh, off of Hawaii, which is a, a a huge area, and I was going to take a shot at, at pronouncing the name, but uh, I, I won't. I'll, I'll leave that for uh, uh, somebody with uh, with with better uh, better skills than I. Um, but you know, we could have uh, this goes back to the whole representation part of things. Um, if uh, if most of what we are protecting is in the in the Pacific, uh, that's not going to do uh, a lot for North Atlantic right whales and other uh, species in the Atlantic. So we need more representation of uh, ocean protection. And the last thing I wanna say about 30 by 30 is that uh, I have uh, been pulled into to too many debates about what is and what should and shouldn't be considered conserved or protected. Gap one, gap two, gap three, would national forests fit in there? Would they not? How much is enough in that? And I, I, I've, I'm trying to harness my inner, um, it, my, my, my inner Captain Barbosa here. And if, if you remember from that, that uh, first of the Pirates of the Caribbean, um, when he was talking to Elizabeth about the Pirates Code, he was like, thirdly, the code is more what you call guidelines than actual rules. And so if we find ourselves embroiled in a debate about how much is enough or, or uh, you know, what is protected versus not protected, I, I ask you to, to, to reach in for, for your um, inner Captain Barbosa and, and, uh, and think about these are more like guidelines than actual rules. Let's, let's talk about um, protecting a good chunk of natural lands to help keep water and air clean for people and wildlife and not get embroiled in these numbers. So after uh, 30 by 30 came out, um, uh, our science team at National Wildlife Federation came out with uh, these uh, principles for achieving the, the goals. <coughs> um, and uh, I won't go through all of them here, but I do wanna shift the focus now on to talking about building on existing collaborative efforts uh, like state wildlife action plans, regional and local conservation plans, and ecosystem focused plans. Well, this is from the early days of uh, what I call the Northeast Conservation Collaborative. And that was the Fish and Wildlife Service folks and the states coming together after the completion of the first wildlife action plans um, to talk about uh, how we could integrate our conservation planning processes uh, to, to deliver uh, real conservation action on the ground. And these things, um, the, the eight required elements uh, lined up well with, with uh, stuff that had been 
um, you know, produced in the uh, in in the the various I, I'm trying to think conservation design um, uh, uh, process that was was being described by the Fish and Wildlife Service. So um, there's a, a long history uh, in this region of the states, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and now uh, with the Climate Science Centers working together to do conservation planning um, and, and implementation and to get information from um, the scientists and specialists to the managers on the ground. I'm sorry, does somebody have a comment? Nope, don't worry about it, John, you're doing great. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, so, uh, and, and I, I just, I have been uh, one of the primary cheerleaders, I guess you would say, of re regionally based uh, conservation initiatives. Um, and one of the things that has received a lot of attention uh, is the Northeast was the first region. And when I say region, I'm, I'm talking about the uh, regional association, uh, Northeast Regional Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, uh, to develop uh, based on its collective species of greatest conservation need. Uh, a regional species of greatest conservation need list. Um, and that work has now been done in the Southeast and Midwest as well. And I, I think a lot of attention has been given to these species lists and these species priorities, which have been extremely valuable for, uh, um, uh, you know, for really moving the needle um, in, uh, in conservation of, uh, of species, not only those that are currently listed, but those that are headed for listing. And we, we have some great examples of, of how uh, from that process of prioritizing uh, species at a regional scale, things like the New England cottontail, Blanding's turtle, now wood and spotted turtle have gotten detailed attention. Um, I'm unabashedly uh, still a promoter of species conservation um, and especially for those species that we see headed uh, for the list. And I think these, um, you know, these examples really serve as a way of showing folks how with um, taking it from the beginning, the research, the survey process to the end, the implementation in a coordinated fashion across state lines uh, with federal and uh, state and local jurisdictions working together uh, presents a great model uh, for doing landscape scale conservation. Uh, and, and some of this, um, you know, the successes of this uh, performance metrics, uh, you know, here we have something from Blanding turtle focus areas in, uh, in New Hampshire, uh, adopted by the Natural Resource Conservation Service as uh, high uh, uh, tier habitat for um, wetland reserve easements. And, uh, and, and you know, we, we have a, not only a focal map that was produced by, um, you know, real surveys with real people doing things in a consistent manner across uh, a number of different states for that, that species Northeast range. Um, and now we have measures for the su success and the conservation uh, of, of that species within, within that uh, area. And for all the species of regional conservation need for the Northeast, there's actually a database. Um, some of you have probably been into that, but you can, you can uh, search by species and look at threats um, and, uh, it, it, you know, and, and identify different information. I, I think of it as kind of a real time uh, uh, species by species um, wildlife action assessment. But it wasn't always, it wasn't about species. It wasn't about species in our, in the wildlife uh, action plan process or just about species or in the regional process. It was also about mapping um, habitats and identifying those, um, the, the, uh, the highest rank ecological condition. Uh, something that we did uh, here, here in New Hampshire um, and that model uh, was extended on to uh, working over the Northeast um, as a total. And I think I saw, I uh, have to have a shout out to Katie Callahan from New Hampshire Fish and Game, the GIS specialist um, 
uh, who uh, was there from the beginning uh, with our first wildlife action plan um, and, and helped usher through uh, the regional habitat classification mapping uh, process as well. And this was a, a priority action um, even before we did our regional species of greatest conservation need, the, the number one priority is we needed a common habitat classification for aquatic and terrestrial habitats, um, and we need to map those. And to do that, uh, the, the Northeast States, the Nature Conservancy working with Mark Anderson's shop, and at the time, um, the, the, uh, the North Atlantic LCC, which uh, uh, Andrew Milliken um, was, was in charge of there, went about the process um, of, of developing this common habitat classification system and this map that covers the entire region. So the last thing uh, I wanna talk about is why I think these regional scale plans um, have so much promise. Yes, they are bounded by uh, you know political boundaries because they they they're, they're uh, in, you know surrounded or, or inclusive of uh, a region of states, um, but they are at a scale that's that's you know large enough to encompass uh, you, you know species ranges um, to look at things at a landscape scale, but they offer a form of of kind of governance and oversight. Um, where we have regional state wildlife agency associations and fish and wildlife service regions uh, overlapping. I think just as a planning unit, um, it, they, they seem to, to work very well and as a, a coordination and an implementation unit. And of course, um, with the, the support of uh, the um, climate adaptation science centers, we, we can uh, you know, do the kind of really cool modeling and applications that I've seen today that are, are going to uh, you know, be uh, future guided looking at, at, uh, at the best available science to see um, not just where we thought we needed to be protecting uh, natural lands for, for, for wildlife, but uh, where we need to be based on, on the climate uh, changes that we expect to see in the future. So I'll end with that um, and, and, uh, and just, you know, thinking about from going forest stand maps to the basics of GIS all the way to a time when, um, you know, we can, can sit at our, our desks or kitchen tables as I am doing here today uh, and click around and look at uh, different places on the earth. We've come a long way with the technology. We've come a long way with the science. Um, and I think the most important thing is to think about how we as people uh, collaborate to work together so that we build on the work of the past uh, and we look to the future um, and see how we can build uh, from that base uh, and, and to do something um, you know, that, is, that is, is going to meet the tremendous need and demands um, of, of uh, conservation and, and wildlife biology in the future. Thank you, John. And I assume if you if people have questions, if they could put them in the chat, that would probably be best. And we may have time for one since we're running behind. If we don't, and if and uh, I guess I have a question if I uh, to to get things going. So can you get you know you 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 talked about. Um, you're still an advocate for species. So how did you, how do you, do you have any examples of where you've taken a particular species and looked at its needs and what you need to conserve on the landscape and stitch that together to get a broader representation of uh, what we're talking about of landscape scale designs? Because they don't I, necessarily. Uh, yeah, I think the two, the two best examples, um, you know, one which was kind of rolling along a little bit when, you know, when when we were uh, scaling up our wildlife action plans, and that was with New England cottontails. I mean, we, you know, we knew uh, after the 
uh, Tony Turr and uh, and Steve Fuller developed that that uh, conservation plan along with the, the input of many others that. You know, we knew acreages, we knew parcels, and you need to know where you're going to go. And, uh, you know, and then in the case of a, a, of a, a species like that, it is dependent on, um, uh, you know, young, young forests or, or young seral stages in, in habitat, um, you know, what, what the kind of techniques for conversion were going to be. And the same thing, I think, with Blanding's turtles were there earlier in the process. Um, and, and I think the, the ultimate metric there is, is, is uh, I guess, stopping the bleeding. We know there are going to be populations of that, of that species that are still in existence now that are going to go extinct based on uh, the density of, uh, of roads and stuff in, in certain landscapes. Um, but by going to those areas where their, the strength of their population overlaps with um, you know, intact habitat and moving our resources there to to uh, to save those the, those places. Um, you know, we we get ahead of or I, I guess we meet the goal of um, you know providing a representation of different areas within the Northeast that will still hold Blanding's turtles into the future. Great, thanks, John. Um, we're gonna move on to our next presenter, uh, who is Scott Phillips, and he's with the US Geological Survey. And he will be, he will, excuse me, he will be presenting on using science to guide restoration and conservation in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, Scott currently serves as the uh, USGS Chesapeake Bay coordinator, has over 30 years of experience conducting and directing scientific investigations related to ecosystem studies. So John, or um, Scott, I turn it over to you. You guys see my screen okay? I see it fine. Good. All right, afternoon, everybody. Just wanted to give you an overview of some of the science approaches we're using for landscape decisions in the Chesapeake Bay program. And really try to cover three things today, what some of the Chesapeake issues and goals are. Uh, focus mostly on the science approaches, but then an important part of this is in engaging stakeholders and in informing decisions they have for restoration and protection. So just some quick facts about the Chesapeake. You know, it's America's largest estuary. It's about 200 miles long, uh, drains a very large watershed, 64,000 square miles. It stretches from the Finger Lakes down to Southern Virginia and from the Delmarva over to the mountains of West Virginia. So there's an incredible amount of biodiversity within this watershed, almost 24 different, 2,400 different species of plants and animals. And some of the iconic ones are uh, the blue crab, uh, as well as uh, the bay really is the spawning ground for most of the striped bass on the East Coast. and then. It's right in the heart of the Atlantic Flyway, so you have almost 30 different species of, of waterfowl that utilize the, the Bay region. You know, along with this biodiversity, it's home, work, and play for about 18 million people. And all told, the goods and services of the Bay and its watershed are estimated to be about uh, $100 billion a year. But even with that, that uh, value, we've been hurt by declining fish and wildlife populations due to loss of habitat, poor water quality and land disturbance. And you know, the root causes of those have really been just the, the growth of the amount of people in the watershed and the associated development, how they use the land and climate change. So there's a large restoration effort underway from the Chesapeake Bay program. And that's a, a federal state partnership. It was formed uh, about 30 years ago. Uh, it's led by EPA. Department of Interior has a large involvement, as well as uh, USDA, NOAA, and Department of Defense. And those federal agencies work with uh, agencies from the six states across the watershed, as well as DC. And they interact with each other uh, through goal teams, which I'll get to. Um, but on a political level, it, this executive council is the six governors, as well as the EPA administrator representing the federal government. 
and they work through a series of voluntary agreements that are they're based on science. Uh, but these agreements have to be adopted by all six governors as well as the, as the federal government. So the latest agreement was uh, the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement, which was signed in 2014. And it has uh, a lot of goals and outcomes to be met by 2025. And those are focused both on the estuary and watershed. And I'd put those, those goals into you know, several categories that I have grouped here. Uh, and I'll explain these categories based on this conceptual diagram. This is the current conditions within the bay and its watershed, and this is what we're striving to achieve in the future. And this first group of goals are really more restoration focused, where they're trying to restore both fin fish and shellfish in the bay um, by bringing back uh, the water quality they depend on. And the bay has been uh, has an overabundance of nutrients, which causes algal blooms. Every summer we have low dissolved oxygen, which results in the fish kills. And so one of the big goals is to try to improve that water quality in the estuary by reducing nutrients and sediment that come from the watershed and cause these algal blooms. Um, we also have uh, coastal habitats are really important, submerged aquatic vegetation and coastal wetlands that are important for for waterfowl, so there's goals to try to increase their presence. Uh, I mentioned the water quality goals in the estuary, but there's also goals to try to improve uh, water quality conditions to support streams in the watershed and inland fisheries. There's a big focus on trying to restore these habitat conditions for important recreational fish, such as uh, smallmouth, largemouth bath, and, and brook trout. And then finally, trying to reduce the effects of toxic contaminants on those streams in the bay. We, we've got a lot of fish consumption advisories due to an overabundance of PCBs and mercury. Um, the other two, next two goals, I, I put in the, the protection category. So there's, a, there's goals of trying to maintain healthy watersheds through land conservation. And right now there's a focus on trying to conserve another 2 million acres throughout the Bay watershed. Uh, the third group of goals are really trying to get the 18 million people more involved. So this is enhanced stewardship, increased access to the water, both in the watershed and the tidal waters, and really trying to um, interact with schools to increase the curriculum on environmental literacy. And then finally, uh, there's a forward-looking goal of trying to make sure all these are more resilient to climate change. So uh, that's what exists now, but we have looked at the new administration priorities. Uh, and as you can envision, America the Beautiful lines up both with uh, protection, but as well as restoration. So we're trying to have a, a focus of how to better align with that. Uh, we've looked at trying to better align with some of the new administration priorities towards climate resilience, as well as uh, environmental justice and diversity through some of our stewardship goals. So while this uh, agreement is really trying to meet existing goals that were established 10 years ago, we are trying to take advantage of these new administration priorities to accelerate progress towards our goals, because we're finding that uh, probably over half of them are behind schedule and we're gonna have a hard time meeting them by 2025. Next, I just wanna to try to talk about the science approaches we're using to meet some of those goals. And we've put the goals in sort of represented by the green boxes and outcomes, these little red dots into a conceptual diagram. And what we're really trying to do from a science perspective is a look at the interconnection between the populations of, of fish, wildlife, and the benefits to people. And so a lot of the fisheries is really trying to focus on improving the water quality and habitat conditions for those fisheries, both in the estuary and the watershed. As I mentioned, we're trying to improve SAV and wetlands for uh, waterfowl, and then trying to conserve healthy lands that provide both recreational and uh, economic benefit for the people in the watershed. A lot of the focus is on the interventions 
uh, to try to bring back these habitat and water quality conditions uh, to sustain or restore these populations. And these management interventions are not only trying to improve these conditions, but also trying to look at mitigating future impacts of climate change and population growth. So while the Bay program has different groups looking at these goals, uh, the science is trying to look at the interconnection between the goals and really trying to say, as you're putting in management interventions and practices, are you seeing the desired response in the conditions and finally in the populations? So the, for the science, we tried to provide information on the types of practices, the places you want to put them in, and are you getting the ecosystem response uh, that you want to have? And so uh, for practices and policies, there's both a focus on restoration and protection. For places, this is a large watershed, so we want to focus on where you're going to get the largest benefit, ecological benefit of that restoration and protection, and where can you address some of these multiple outcomes I showed in the previous slide. Then we have a component on monitoring or to say, to document whether that those practices are getting the ecological benefit you want, but also forecasting to say what future conditions may be and how do we have to manage for them. And the, the science is really also trying to make these watershed connections about what's done in the watershed and how does it impact the estuary. So let me talk a little bit about practices. So when I say practices, these are the different Chesapeake Bay goal teams and document in the uh, diagram on the right. So each of these goal teams uh, comes up with the practices and policies to meet those goals and outcomes that I showed earlier. And this is where you have interaction between the stakeholders on a federal, state, and local level uh, with the scientists trying to make informed decisions. And the decisions are pretty large. There's almost uh, $1.7 billion of restoration occurring between the federal and state dollars uh, throughout all of these goals that I described. And so for, for instance, for the fisheries and habitat goals in, in the estuary, a lot of that work is led by NOAA working with Maryland and Virginia, but up in the watershed, the US Fish and Wildlife Service leads a lot of the effort working with inland game and fishery commissions and agencies within the states. For water quality, this is the largest effort because it's, there's a regulatory requirement to meet those improved standards in the estuary. So this is mostly led by EPA and USDA has a, a large uh, involvement. Trying to maintain healthy watersheds through land protection, that's really led by the National Park Service uh, under a partnership called the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership. So that's where federal state agencies or N NGOs really try to align their dollars for land protection. Uh, Park Service also leads stewardship. This is getting people more involved and EPA as the overall leadership of the program. Now the science for to inform all of these is led by uh, multiple partners. USGS has the lead role in the science, uh, but we work with federal, state, and academic institutions to really provide the science that helps inform, inform practices and places to put these different, uh, to reach these different goals and outcomes. So one thing you've heard a lot about mapping today, and that's something that's uh, been done over the, in, through the Bay program. Uh, when we signed this agreement several years ago, uh, people felt a little overwhelmed. So they said, we had 31 outcomes, you know, how are we gonna decide where to focus our efforts for those outcomes? So we went through a, a prioritization process where we asked each of those goal teams, give us your six top outcomes that you want us to look at. Uh, based on those, those outcomes, we came up with spatial data that could be used to map where we could get most of the benefits. And those maps were used to try to align stakeholder funding and practices in different areas. And You've seen a lot of maps today, but this just shows uh, the maps we've developed for the Chesapeake, where you know we are trying to uh, focus on living resources recovery, both in the estuary itself for fin, fin fish, crabs, oysters, uh, as well as in the watershed for want to make sure we have uh, inland fish habitat, 
uh, restored as well as uh, connectivity through ecological integrity. And a lot of that was focused on trying to improve water quality through reducing nitrogen and phosphorus as well as toxic contaminant impairments. So, so at the beginning phase, this mapping was just trying to take different characteristics that we had throughout the watershed, pretty much put them on top of each other. And where you see the darker colors, that's where more of these characteristics lined up. So theoretically, if you put in more practices in those areas, you would get benefits to multiple uh, outcomes and characteristics. Uh, and then same, same type of approach for protection came up with criteria that where people were trying to protect living resource areas within the, the estuary that included oysters as well as uh, high marsh habitat for, for black ducks and other migratory birds. Looked at areas in the watershed also for important for fish habitat and cold water species such as brook trout and conservation opportunity areas. And again, just put all these together and and showed where it, in places with darker colors, if you focus there, you would have um, potentially greater benefits to these outcomes. So this helped guide some of where people wanted to focus uh, restoration or protection activities. But people also wanted to understand uh, what is the ecosystem response as you put all these activities in, are you getting the desired benefit? And also being doing some forecasting, which um, you know, similar to a lot of the work that's done in the, the Climate Adaptation Science Center. So the USGS, we refined our science plan based on that agreement and pretty much are taking a landscape approach where we're trying to look at essentially uh, freshwater streams and how they're important for both uh, the stream biota and freshwater fisheries and aquatic conditions as far as transport of nutrients down to the bay. Uh, habitat conditions along the coastlines, uh, pretty much coastal wetlands and SAB, and how uh, they might be changed due to sea level rise. And then did a lot of work on just land change characterization, and then make sure we did it had an integrated approach and work with stakeholders to inform decisions. So just a little bit more on a couple of these. So what we focused on for for this first theme is, is really trying to look at, uh, again, the, the habitat and population response to management interventions. So we looked at, uh, divided the watershed up in several different landscapes from cold water, cold headwaters down to larger rivers, and then the connection to the estuary. And we're doing studies in each of those landscapes and then working with EPA, USDA, Fish and Wildlife Service to apply the results for some of their decision-making, whether it's water quality improvement or habitat restoration. We also did some work on trying to forecast how these areas may change in the future. And this is just a map here showing a forecasting of where we could have influence on stream health due to either climate change or development out several decades with um, climate change being in, in the red and development more being in the yellow. So this, this is similar to a lot of the work you've seen today on trying to forecast where areas could be affected in the future to help say, how do we want to design restoration and protection in those areas? And a lot of this work is used by Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA to make decisions in the watershed and estuary respectively. We've got, a lot of work on status and trends and not just USGS, we collected data from multiple agencies to try to look at ecosystem response as all these practices are put in. So we're, we've got different, what we call domains for information on fish populations and benthic organisms, habitat condition and water quality conditions. And do where we can trends over time, this is water quality trends, nitrogen change over time, blue improving, yellow degrading, and this sort of information is used by EPA, USDA to try to focus, surf, focus um, and assess how successful are their water quality improvement practices. This is probably the toughest part, trying to come up with the monitoring networks to look at uh, ecosystem response over time, because a lot of these need to be at least a decade long, if not longer. 
So similar approach in the coastal areas, just really quickly, we're trying to focus on effects of sea level rise and storm surge and land subsidence in these coastal systems, uh, particularly SAV and coastal wetlands and trying to make their relation to how's that gonna affect water bird habitats in these that are so important for these coastal areas. So that's work that we are interfacing with Fish and Wildlife Service and Park Service and Department of Defense. All those have uh, lands along these coastal Chesapeake that they're trying to either restore or protect due to sea level rise. And then we have a focus working with Fish and Wildlife Service on what are the implications for, for water bird habitats. And I'll finish up with just our last theme. This is where we're really trying to improve the information we have on land characterization. And we've taken um, work from Landsat where you have 30 by 30 meter resolution and we've been able to get uh, one meter resolution for land cover within the watershed. And this one meter resolution is helping with having much more focused restoration planning of where you want to put practices in. We're also looking at the landscape characteristics, how they can affect vulnerability and resilience to both land and climate change. And then working with groups on, you know, what are some of the practice land management practices that are being put in and how effective they are in these different watershed settings. So that's a lot of work being done with uh, Park Service, EPA, and USDA as they're trying to make land protection decisions. I'll just finish up with uh, some other stakeholder engagement. I've given you some examples we've had here. As I mentioned at the beginning, the stakeholder engagement is really important because the Bay Program is trying to accelerate progress to meet their goals by 2025 through best use of resources. They have an adaptive management program like many systems do where they revise and review each of these outcomes in two year cycles and say, what did, we, what did we learn? What do we need to do better? And that's where the science really comes in for this informed decision making. But uh, the science is to be able to make it effective for decision makers, we really put a lot of effort into translating the science, whether it's into fact sheets or summary briefings, so people can take what might be in a complex journal article and try to apply it for decision making. And a lot of that's just direct interaction also with the stakeholders. Um, as I mentioned, we're trying to make these connections between outcomes as well as take advantage of these new administration priorities. And I'll just finish with my last couple of slides. You know, I mentioned the new administration priorities. We, we've really done a crosswalk between some of the, the three big ones for the environmental community across the top, as well as science integrity, and looked at how they, they meet existing Bay Program goals, but then how can the Bay Program stretch some of these existing goals? For instance, they're, they're working to have a, a new goal to try to protect and restore 30% of the lands in the watershed by 2030. Uh, they just signed a new climate directive several weeks ago with the governors and EPA of better looking at mitigation options for all these different outcomes. And they've been working on a new directive of getting better inclusion and diversity in the program. So it's a big push by Department of Interior and uh, to help with this. Uh, one of the programs we're really excited about is the US Fish and Wildlife Service Chesapeake Wild Program. That stands for Watershed Investment for Landscape Defense. And I think can, can really help meet some of these uh, bridge the gap between protection and restoration. Uh, but with all these programs, I think there's some challenges and opportunities trying to move forward and just try to sum those up here at the end. And some of the challenges we have in the Chesapeake is there's such a large focus on water quality restoration that the other 30 outcomes don't get as much attention. And that's because the water quality restoration is a regulatory requirement. Uh, so, you know, we've been really pushing the Bay Program leadership to emphasize the multiple benefits you can get from water quality practices. When you put in something for uh, restoring, I mean, uh, retaining nutrients on the surface, how can it also help stream quality and associated fish habitat, for instance? Because we do have so many different outcomes, um, you know, we have different stakeholder priorities of what they want to focus on, which some of that is good, but 
um, we definitely need better alignment of stakeholder programs and funding to accelerate progress towards the goals I've talked about. As you can imagine, we've got a lot of tools for decisions, uh, almost 10 different tools for those different goals, but we really need more a more integrated approach to apply these tools so that people aren't going to different platforms to make decisions. And then those decisions really depend on go from a regional to a local type scale. And you know, we've got a lot, a lot of maps for regional information, but when we try to get to more local decision-making, we need to go down from the states and work mostly with the local governments who make a lot of the land change decisions. Uh, and most of the watershed is in private ownership hands. So about 80% of the watershed, you've got to work with private landowners for them to be willing to put in practices. Uh, and that's, that's a big challenge in the Chesapeake. So that gives you a quick summary of what we're trying to do in the Chesapeake. Uh, here's a link to some of the Bay program uh, information, as well as what we're doing within USGS and just uh, my contact info also. So Rick, I'll stop there. I don't know if there's any time for questions or not. Well, I think in the interest of time, there is a question in the chat and I'd ask you to take a look at that and maybe you can provide a response in the chat. Okay, will do. That's we're running a little behind. All right. Um, so with that, thank, thank you, Scott. And uh, I'd like to introduce our final speaker, who is Valerie Hipkins from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And she'll talk about uh, landscape conservation planning, management drivers, existing tools, and information needs. Valerie has uh, over 27 years of experience and currently serves as the Assistant Regional Director of Science Applications in the North Atlantic Appalachian region of the service. She joined the service uh, uh, just recently in the last year, uh, coming from the research and development branch of the US Forest Service. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Valerie. Thank you, Rick. And I assume you can see my screen, the PowerPoint? I can, you're all Perfect. Set. Well, you know, John and Scott did such a good job, and I sincerely mean that. They covered a lot of the same points I wanted to cover that I'm going to give an abbreviated version of my, my presentation, just hitting a couple of points, and then get us all into the breakout uh, uh, sessions, because we really uh, are looking forward to getting feedback from, from all of you. So the points I just want to make briefly is, um, how we consider landscape conservation designs here in the Fish and Wildlife Service. And oftentimes we really concentrate on the science and the data and the remote sensing and the, the maps and the analytics, but it, it really is a people process too. And I, and I don't wanna lose sight of that. Um, I bet you I can share this somehow. Let's see here. Um, because what we, we are really, where I want to put like the full circle on this is that all of the science has got to be guided by our, collaborate, our collaboration. Um, a, a landscape um, conservation design is, is created by people, you know, people with shared priorities. So our vision for all of our landscape conserva conservation designs, no matter what the scale, are really um, uh, creating a network of connected lands and waters to achieve our outcomes. Oftentimes those outcomes are around stemming biodiversity loss, mitigating climate impact, uh, connecting underserved communities uh, with the outdoors, preserving cultural heritage and supporting healthy communities. I'm gonna skip that. And this is overly simplified, but, but, but still I think, um, so kind of sets a stage for how, how uh, we are thinking about some landscape designs and, and the process in which we use them. And so um, a landscape design really is, is when you get a group of people or organizations that come together to identify the kinds of conservation goals we wanna collectively achieve for that landscape. You know, so what is it we all care about? What are, what are we trying to achieve together? And then once that conservation design is, is, is determined, and, and John and, and uh, Scott both talked about a lot of those kind of uh, shared goal um, opportunities that, that we're, we're trying to achieve, that's when we need the maps and the data 
uh, to support that conservation design. So, you know, we are go out then to our research uh, partners, science partners, create, uh, get data layers, um, and then usually those get added into a decision support tool that can show the value of certain habitats, which are linked to the features of the initial design. So how are we gonna use that data to, to help us make those decisions um, uh, that we've defined in our design? Often I think a blueprint, sometimes I'm seeing used synonymously with conservation designs. I think probably a little more accurately in my mind anyway, a blueprint is the visualization through the uh, data analytic process um, of the conservation design. But then the cycle then goes back to the, back to the partnership and the collaboratives. It's how do we come together to use that information that the, the, the science has provided that our decision support tools have, have provided us. And then that's going to influence um, any needed modifications to the design and then this, the cycle keeps, keeps turning. So we have a lot of different landscapes here. Um, Chesapeake was just sp spoken about, uh, Delaware River, um, uh, Connect, uh, Connecticut, Connect, Connect, Connect the Connecticut actually is very interesting because as I understand it, it really served as the, the uh, foundation to what we consider our regional design, which is nature's network. And nature's network, I think is a great example if you use those three components to my cycle. It was a group of organizations that came together about five years or so ago, I believe. Uh, many of you on this call probably were part of that and know better. Uh, they developed an excellent conservation design. It's supported with really robust data, but, but be, in, the, in the space of these last probably four years or so, we kind of lost the, the collaborative around that, the governance structure on that. And so it's hard then to, in, uh, to use the information that comes out of Nature's Network because we still actually are updating data all the time in that, um, and then to reinform it because if you've had a conservation design for five years, it, it probably needs an update because one thing about decision support tools, conservation designs, they're not static. These are dynamic systems. So I always say they're verbs, they're not nouns. It's, it's a process that we commit to. And, and so for Nature's Network, it was designed to be a, a connected network of resilient and ecologically intact habitats that support biodiversity. And with all those bullet points are, are the, some of the outcomes, conservation outcomes that people were looking um, for. Um, uh, you know, but I could keep talking about Nature's Network. I'm trying to do a shorter version. So it's, it's, it's really though trying, Nature's Network is a design and tools that are structured to identify the best opportunities for conserving and connecting in ha intact habitats and ecosystems and importing in um, um, supporting imperiled species. And I think just last, I do wanna uh, acknowledge uh, all of the folks that contribute to the data. And this is not everybody, so apologies to anyone not, not uh, uh, listed, but it's got a really robust set of many, many data sets that come from many different sources um, that really support those conservation goals. And, and I'm just gonna stop there and get us into some, some um, uh, breakout sessions. But uh, when, when I think of this full circle, you know, of how we go about implementing a conservation design, supporting it and using it, I, it, I do really see that link between science and, and management. You know, we need those who create usable science and we need those that uh, require the usable science uh, to, uh, for their decision-making. And when you have both of those, then you can actually have the most informed, uh, the best available science, the right science um, that are informing our, our conservation goals and really drive us collectively toward those things that we want to, to achieve. Uh, last point is nature's network for me, um, I am very interested in one of our questions that, that's gonna follow in our breakout because it is a regional conservation design. And I think all, as I said, all conservation designs are, are scale specific and all have different uses. And I'm really interested in what people's feedback are 
for their interest in a region-wide conservation design. And, and I'll throw it out there. Do we need a Nature's Network 2.0? Or are there other regional designs that, that, that work more effectively for people? Or do we need some kind of combination? Um, so I'd really love feedback on that. So with that, Rick, I'm actually going to stop and turn it back to you. Thank you, Valerie. Um... Again, in the interest of time and the importance of getting into the breakout sessions, because we really want feedback from um, everybody. Um, uh, if there are any questions, uh, put them in the chat and, and, and we'll try to get a response back to folks uh, accordingly. So first I'd like to, uh, I really want to thank every, all the presenters for taking the time and presenting today and remind everybody that now we're going to go into breakout sessions. 